It's the week ending Saturday the 9th of November and this is the week unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen South Africa winning the Rugby World Cup, the resignation of Tom Watson as Deputy Leader of Labour and the death of Irish broadcasting legend Gay Byrne. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news not making headlines right now but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann and that's another week. And joining me today from the week's digital team is Kari Wilkin, Arian McNichol, and making his week unwrapped debut, the bell of the ball, it's James Ashford. Welcome to the team, James. Thank you for having me. Tell us something we don't know about you. Uh, This isn't my first foray into the world of broadcast. I was previously banned from student radio for insulting the Duke of Edinburgh. Okay, that is an amazing factoid. Uh, Let's see if you can bring such skill to your news story because you're going first this week. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Why, at school, it's survival of the cutest. In an analysis of data from almost 9,000 high school students, researchers found that yet again, the prettier students had better grades. But being the best looking didn't matter so much as being better looking than average. Those who weren't as attractive were more depressed and had fewer friends, issues that could affect school performance. But being hot doesn't necessarily mean you get the best grades. While they might have had better grades, they also got more distracted by dating and partying, which of course offset some of the gains in grades. And it's just, well, society treats you better if you're considered hot. A clip from Seeker entitled, Why Attractive People Get Better Grades. Uh, James, why do attractive people get better grades? So this week we've seen a new study by US academics who found that good-looking kids do better at school than their less fortunately faced peers. Um, The study discovered that attractive kids got a test score boost that was equivalent to around five months extra schooling compared to their uglier pals. Wow. The researchers based their study on two separate existing child development studies, one from the US and one from the UK. The US study, the kids were assessed by a panel of undergraduate students who watched segments of a video of them being interviewed. And in the UK study, teachers were asked to rate the attractiveness of the kids. That sounds like a fallible metric. (laughs) Yeah, that's the thing, because often your views on how attractive someone is changes very quickly as you get to know their personality. She's saying this looking at me, (laughs) (laughs) and I'm getting the impression it's only gone downhill. No, (laughs) no, you're gorgeous. Sure. So, you know, it, it it does seem like it would have felt like possibly a better test would just be shown photos or whatever you know the teacher knows the personality of the, these children for example you know you're, you're less likely to rate someone as attractive if you just don't like them okay but I mean putting aside you know how they did the social science of rating the attractive you have to rate the attractiveness somehow otherwise you don't have the data they have a data set showing the scale of attractive children however you qualify that and the more attractive children perform better at school it's really interesting isn't it because we've talked before on this show Arian about the kind of studies that show that people who are better looking are more likely to get a good job and we've discussed that and said oh well you could put that down to all kinds of things you know people employing other people who look like them or people who project a certain image whatever at school that can't be the case it shouldn't reflect itself in academic achievement it feels sort of um counterintuitive anecdotally don't you reckon i i I don't remember walking around school and going god those hot kids do so (laughs) well (laughs) they're so smart and hot how dare they you know it seemed to be kind of one or the other was the thing that you said in school but it does seem like a, a fascinating story and you can see how it relates to that other case that you know once you're set up from the beginning if you're going to start doing well as a better looking person early in life then that will stand you in good stead to get better jobs later on. What are the theories James that people have as to why this is the case? The evidence found that teachers basically reported better relationships with the more attractive students so if the teachers were getting on better with the kids and there's a suggestion there that they might be focusing on them more giving them more attention maybe being more generous when they make mistakes being more generous with their time that they also found that unattractive kids were somewhat more likely to report being bullied by their peers Mm. so obviously you've got the detrimental spillover from being bullied and how that impacts academic performance i think that's probably an interesting point there are also fewer reports of behavioral problems at school among the children who are rated as being more attractive but actually yeah i mean what arian was saying kari it's not just that brains doesn't always seem to be matched by physical beauty 
It's also the kind of, and this is what we get at when we talk about it in the workplace, is that if you are considered conventionally attractive, you can kind of coast. You don't have to try so hard. That I'm, seems to be at odds with this. This I'm is saying sure. scores in exams. Yeah, I'm not sure it is about coasting. I think we associate beauty with success. Humans, are, we're programmed to like beauty because we associate it. The things we count as beautiful are often very good signs of good health, of, you know, and it all ties into, you know, procreation. But, you know, beauty is associated with success, so it creates a positive cycle so these kids aren't coasting they just experiences have shown that good looking people are perceived as more intelligent and mentally healthy so you know as we've said so teachers may devote more time to attractive kids and students actually may be more likely to listen to good looking teachers I mean conversely it's been found that um, a 2016 US study found that college students retain more information when the lecturer is good looking so it just becomes a positive a positive cycle so I don't think it's these kids are getting better grades because they're they're being given an easier time I think they're being given better teaching. Vice had uh, a very Vice article which was called the agony and ecstasy of being incredibly hot. <laughs> and um, we can all sympathise. Yeah. That's one of my blogs, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, it yeah. might have been. Um, and the flip side, they were trying to say of the advantages you get by being an attractive person, which is that people think that you're more intelligent and trustworthy and have better social skills and all of that stuff, is that looks eventually fade and the, and people who have been good looking struggle in later life because they've been set up to kind of rest on their looks and all of the advantages that they started to get out of them earlier in life disappear later and they end up miserable. But in terms of the education, you've already, but then you've got the gains and, and surely the benefits you get from having been beautiful are better than just not having been beautiful at all. Still worth keeping in your back pocket, isn't it? When you <laughs> go and visit your kids at kindergarten and you'll be like, oh, well, it doesn't matter that you're struggling now. That particularly cute kid over there, they're going to have a terrible septuagenarian lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> you wait till it catches up with it. James, what do you think people can actually do about this? I mean, it, it, it seems like our analysis of it, you know, albeit only based on pricey of some newspaper articles, is kind of, um, well, it's all to do with our genes and, you know, there are unspoken forces at work. So what can you actually do to correct it? I think just dress your kids better. Um, <laughs> good haircuts. Yeah. No, that's gaming the system. Oh, okay, right. If you're a teacher, for example, I mean, I suppose seriously, are you supposed to spend more time with unattractive children? I guess you have to assess the biases of the teachers. So that is, in, interestingly, in the UK study, they didn't just say, are they attractive or not? There were four categories that the teachers could rate the kids. They were attractive, unattractive, abnormal feature, or underfed, scruffy and dirty. Wow. The social element's really interesting, actually, because they found that raters actually gave higher ratings to the kids from higher income families. So there was that statistical significance there where they found that the kids who kind of come from wealthier backgrounds were getting higher attractiveness ratings. And they also found that having a father in a higher social class was related to a greater value added in their test scores. So, it, I mean, they were literally saying the attractive kids are from better off families and they're going to do better at school. I mean, is this not something we need to address, address across wider society? Society. I mean, there, there's actually an expression, the beauty premium, which says that the income gap between attractive and unattractive people is comparable to the gap between genders or ethnicities. And perhaps we need to start addressing that in the same way we do address those other issues and actually make, you know, a concerted effort, as you say, to address that issue. And so this could actually be an attractiveness which isn't physically innate, but is caused by nutrients and vitamins coming from a balanced diet of a middle class family or you know the support that gives someone the confidence to walk around with the charisma that makes them more attractive this might not actually be to do with their physical appearance at all and it's probably all bound up you know the the uh, your development the way you dress the way you act all of that stuff i'm sure contributes to people and how people interact with you and how they how attractive they regard you um so yeah so i suppose root social causes to blame as ever. <laughs> and also the emphasis on beauty and everything. Previous studies have found that attractive university students tend to get better grades, but that was much more pronounced among female students. And I think that all ties into the fact that women are still tend to be judged far more on their looks than men. And I think it's, you know, this all ties into far wider issues. There was a study actually that I saw from a university in Sicily, which they sent out job applications um, on behalf of students. And I think they used the students' photos um, in some of them, and the women, the women who were deemed attractive, got uh, responses at fifty-three percent of occasions, whereas the women who were perceived as unattractive got responses on seven percent of occasions. So just having that photo of a 
seemingly attractive person can massively help your career chances. So attach a photo of a really good looking person <laughs> yeah. to your CV when you're applying for jobs. Absolutely. Good one. <laughs> Uh, that would be depressing news for everyone listening, of course, except anyone listening to this is stunningly attractive, needless to say. Arian, you're up next after this. Arian, what do you think this week will be remembered for? This week, the struggle to go green has started giving people the blues. It's pure ideology. You know, this ecological bullshit, like, uh, uh, did you recycle that paper? Did you throw all the newspapers aside? This is to make us feel good. And to, this is a genius of ideology in action. They translate a social problem, how we will restructure, how to restructure our economy and so on, into personal responsibility. This is ideology at its purest, when you criticize a big company and then an idiot comes and tells you, yeah, it's easy to criticize, but what did you do? Did you put all Coke cans aside? Did you do this, that? And if you do it, it's what? It's simply the main function is to make you feel good. You see? You see? I did my duty towards Mother Earth. I carefully put all the cans of Coke here all that I put there and so on. That's the main function of it. It's ideology at its purest. Everyone's favourite Slovenian philosopher, Slavoj Zizek, on ecology and consumerism at the European Graduate School. Arian, why have you brought this high-minded material (laughs) to my podcast? Um, So that was Zizek talking last year, but he makes that case fairly frequently. And I'm hoping to sort of tie it to two separate reports that came out this week. The first was from an employee satisfaction company called Perkbox, which found that one in 10 Brits has actually considered leaving their job due to concerns about the environment, be it the the company itself that they're working for or their own behaviour within the company. And that's kind of the latest in a string of features that have been published in newspapers about this growing sense of green guilt. And Zizek there was talking about how he kind of thinks that green guilt is a nonsense and we should forget about it and the actual problem is big companies themselves. Mm. But the point that he's making about green guilt not necessarily being effective in fighting climate change is fair. And the second report that I wanted to pick up on came from this French consultancy firm called Capgemini which found that global energy demand is continuing to rise. Uh, last year, it went up by 2.3% year on year. So all of our all of our individual behaviours trying to solve global problems by recycling and sorting out our Coke cans, as Zizek says, aren't actually reducing the amount of energy that we are costing the world. Yeah, James, an article that I saw in The Guardian earlier this year said that 20 firms are behind a third of all carbon emissions. So you understand why people feel hopeless to do anything about that on an individual basis. But on the other hand, if they decide to vote with their feet, as this research appears to be saying they're doing, and and go and find another job, the problem is, clearly, other people will go and take that job. It doesn't change the job or the emissions of the company. I think it's very hard to put the responsibility on the individual. Um, as when, as you say, that there are these huge corporations and countries who are doing very little or doing nothing to combat the climate crisis. I think it's interesting in these stats from Perkbox that 64% of people thought that they were actually active or very active in um, changing their daily habits. And yet 89% still felt this horrible green guilt. So they were doing stuff or they thought they were doing stuff, but they still felt pretty guilty. And this is only 64% who claim to be being active and changing their daily lives or perceive themselves as being active. What I found interesting about that statistic was that actually it was 18 to 24 year olds who felt the most guilt, but said they were making the fewest changes. And I think that raises the question of, do they feel guilty because they're not changing their behaviour? Or are they judging themselves more harshly because because they're more keen into the whole issue or is it just a byproduct of being 18 to 24 years old and you could say the same thing with yeah. yeah well no i was thinking you know if you think about the me too scandal for example it was that dem- i mean okay maybe that demographic is more likely to be sexually harassed as well but that demographic basically saying i see this problem going on in my in my office and i feel powerless to do anything about it because i'm not in a position of power i mean that's it isn't it the bosses of these big companies are often in their 60s maybe they don't have the same environmental concerns as millennials. I think that's definitely a good point. But I think that our individual consumption, despite feeling guilty about 
the fact that we're consuming, that's not going down. And I did a bit of digging into each of the sort of key areas that we're often hit with on how we could change our lives and make the world better. Air travel. Apparently, uh, data from the International Air Transport Association shows that 4.4 billion passengers flew in 2018, an increase of 6.9% on the on the previous year and the highest ever. Brits actually also account for the most international air travellers. So on that front, we're not being successful. That's a great fact. I didn't know that fact. Yeah, uh, and not, by the way, not per capita. It's actually just total numbers of, of air travellers globally. Brits are first, then you have uh, Chinese. What? just doesn't make sense. Americans are on planes all the time. Not according, buses. Not according to data from the International Air Transport Association. Really um, yeah. I wonder if it, is it just international flights maybe as opposed to domestic flights? Could be actually. This yeah. was international, yes. I, yeah, right, okay. Um, I can just about believe that. Anyway, I also looked at waste and same with <laughs> same with car use and similar things that, that we say that we're trying to minimise our waste and and maximise our recycling. We say that we're trying to give up cars and this the, it just isn't borne out by the statistics. That's one of the main sort of guilt factors that people cited in the survey was unnecessary use of plastic. And, and you do see all of these campaigns trying to stop people using single-use bottle, water bottles, mm. for example. And I think most of us assume that 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 it is dropping use of, of these sort of things. Whereas, in fact, um, last year, the UK use of plastic water bottles increased by more than 7%. I'm quite interested in this in a work context, though, because you can try and make these changes at home, but actually there might be good reason why there are processes in place at work for disposable items. For example, if you work in the medical industry or you're a vet or something, you know the reasons why the needle is single use, but still that might play on your conscience. You're thinking, God, look how much plastic we get through every day. I mean, at the week, we will have plastic keep cups. So we're doing our bit. Although, obviously, I am going on many flights with the wheat portfolio. <laughs> That's true. We do have a crazy waste system, by the way, where our recycling and non-recyclable stuff all goes into the same bins. I don't know how that works. Everywhere, everywhere else in my life, I have to separate things out. But somehow, we're just able to throw everything into the one bin. And we're told that there's recycling that goes on later down the line and they're able to filter it out. I have no idea how that works. But is it, is it not the herd mentality that if you only see just a couple of workmates who aren't doing it, then you're more inclined to think, I can't be bothered, whereas at home you're on your own, you've got that kind of guilt. And is that not sort of indicative of the bigger problem of no one wants to be the first one to start giving up their air, you know, their air travel and that sort of thing? Because, you know, you've got big business causing all this trouble and no one else is doing it, so why should I? <laughs> and it's that vicious cycle of if it's not getting better, no one's going to do anything. But no one wants to give up their air travel because going overseas is fun and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that and is the most polluting thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, however many cups you recycle at home, if you're taking two trips a year to Australia, as you might, that's it's going to have a big impact. Totally. And that's what's interesting is one of the, the the factors that people said they in the survey they said they felt the least guilty about was unsustainable shopping, excessive energy consumption, and high travel emissions. That's kind of all the fun things, isn't mm. it? Really. Mm. I mean, the thing that has changed in the corporate environment is that if you work in, in an industry that is polluting, you need an answer to that question at least, don't you? I heard Michael O'Leary, the chief executive of Ryanair, on the Today programme this week, and part of the interview, was only three minutes of them announcing their quarterly results, was given over to, aren't you encouraging people to take low-cost airlines, therefore polluting the world? And they needed a corporate line on that in a way that they didn't five years ago. That's the change, isn't it? So even if the jobs get filled... Every industry needs an answer to that question. What are you doing? Did they come up with a line on that? Michael O'Leary has a line for everything, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, you take any of the major oil companies, they're putting out massive advertising campaigns about how they're now re investing in renewable energy and how they're shifting away from just being oil focused. And, y y you know, uh, yes, if even the oil majors are having to do something like this, then, yeah, the message is getting through. And yet, despite us all being able to relate to this stuff, global energy consumption is on the rise. Yeah, and I think that there's various reasons for that that can't be fought at home. For example, population growth and industry expansion across countries like China and India are massively contributing to the fact that the world needs more energy. And, you know, if, if we want for people in developing countries to be able to have the kinds of lifestyles that we have in the, in the developed world, then we should be understanding of where this energy need is coming from. But I think that 
that maybe this is the problem, that we all need to be moving away from the stuff that we've been enjoying, which includes those overseas trips and it includes, you know, printing out of magazines and overuse of paper and, and not recycling when we can't be bothered or whatever, it, for, you know, whatever it is. So I think that we do need to be making those personal decisions because even though it is the big companies that are doing most of the polluting, it's individual demand that's driving that. OK, one last story to come. Kari, you're up next after this. And so finally this week, Kari, it's your turn. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Are we locking our 10-year-olds into lives of crime? The age of criminal responsibility in Scotland at the moment is eight. Um, The Scottish government is proposing to raise it to 12. Um, That moves us from the Middle Ages into the Victorian era. Um, And we think that given what we know about the neurology of young people, the development of their brains, we think it should be 16. Uh, that no child under the age of 16 should be put through the criminal justice system. We should be careful about how we respond to them, but we should respond on the basis of Cobrandon's principle that you think of young offenders as children with needs as well as children who performed deeds that we disapprove of and, and you use a different approach to them. So I think that's probably our most radical and significant uh, proposal. Writer Richard Holloway speaking to STV News. Uh, so, Curry, what's the story? Criminal responsibility. Yeah, so basically what he's talking about, uh, back in May, the Scottish Parliament voted unanimously to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12. So that's basically the age at which children can be arrested, tried and if found guilty, convicted of a crime. Now, this is back in the news this week because campaigners are making a fresh push for the minimum age to be raised in England and Wales. At the moment, the minimum age at which children can be convicted is 10. So to put that into context, this is the age at which children are deemed too young to have their own Facebook page, Mm. but they can be treated as a criminal. England has the lowest minimum age in the EU and the joint lowest in Europe, along with Switzerland. And many critics say, well, it actually completely contravenes the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the UN says that the global minimum age should be 14. Okay, so 14. I mean, I know this gets into sort of, you know, criminal bingo in a way. (laughs) So Scotland went from 8 to 12. England and Wales is 10. They're campaigning for 16, it seems. Why don't they campaign for 14 if the argument is about aligning it with the UN? Well, actually, most uh, campaigners in England are campaigning for 12, not necessarily because they think How that's many numbers correct. are we supposed to keep in I our know, head? Uh, well, it's ultimately, it's arbitrary, isn't it? I think the ultimately the argument is at what point does a child understand the consequences of their actions, which is different from being able to distinguish between bad behaviour and serious wrongdoing. I think, yeah, a 10-year-old probably can, but... You know, children live in the moment. To assume that a 10-year-old or even a 12-year-old, whatever, understands the consequences of what that criminal wrongdoing could be, I think that's that's really the central issue. At which point children can be deemed to to really understand what all this is about and how the whole legal system works. Okay, so let's throw a few more numbers out. Uh, What is the age of criminal responsibility worldwide by comparison? Does anyone have those stats, James? Yeah, so it, it differs from country to country. So with the with the lowest in Europe, along with Switzerland, as mentioned, you've got 12 uh, in Canada, Costa Rica, Lebanon and Turkey. It goes up to 14 in Spain, Italy, Austria and Germany. Uh, it's 14 in Mongolia, Korea, Azerbaijan and Zambia, 15 in Sweden and 16 in Portugal. Yep, and the oldest is Luxembourg, I believe, at 18. Um, I think what's interesting and what really sort of shames England and Wales, if you like, if, if you believe that this is wrong to have, for it to be so low, is that the Philippines earlier this year, they proposed to lower the age of criminal responsibility from 15 to 9. But then there was a major outcry. And that was then bumped up to 12, which is now what they're talking about settling on. But this is a country led by a president, President Duterte, who has called for criminals to be shot on the street, who said that the deaths of children in the country's drug wars is just collateral damage. You know, but even the Philippines thinks that it should be higher than England does. But Arian, in England and Wales, we're not shooting children on the street, are we? They are, you know, regardless of their criminal status, when they end up in an institution afterwards, it does reflect their age and needs, doesn't it? Well, there are different facilities, different types of facilities that 
children who are found guilty of crimes are put into if they are convicted. But, you know, the, the, the question of whether these are nice places and whether they're supportive and whether they're the sorts of things that, that are going to manage to help child criminals or young criminals change their behaviours, that's the big question. And I think that we're sort of grappling with two separate issues here. One is the philosophical question of at what age do young people start to understand right from wrong. And the second question is, and what should you do with people once you mm. uh, once you have a feeling that they do have a comprehension of the thing that they're doing being bad? And, the, and, and I think that what the courts are grappling with is when should we start treating people as criminals and consequently sort of locking them up or punishing them? And I would say that probably realistically we should be looking to push that back as late as possible. So, you know, even ages like 12, 14, 16, these still seem quite young for throwing people into the criminal system, not only to jail, but also courts. I mean, courts are rough places. No, but it just, doesn't it depend on what the crime is? I mean, yes, if they've, you know, stolen a phone. But I mean, if you're talking about murder or sexual harassment or something, regardless of whether the child is 12 or 14, that is a crime and needs to be taken seriously, doesn't it? There were some interesting stats actually that came out from the Met Police last year. They found that there were 57 crimes committed by 10-year-olds, including 29 instances of violence against the person and seven sexual offences. And they also found that there were 426 crimes committed by under 10s um, of a similar nature. There was a fascinating stat, actually, that I saw in The Guardian's roundup of offences committed by 10-year-olds alone between 2010 and 2018. And there was quite a lot of arson and criminal damage and then an even greater amount of theft and the handling of stolen goods. But the most surprising one was the number of motoring offences. 10 motoring offences committed by 10-year-olds in 2010 alone. I thought that was staggering. How they reach the pedals? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but isn't <laughs> that, that the defense. point, though? I mean, presumably, at the moment, a 10-year-old gets in a car. That's dangerous driving, isn't it? They don't need to do anything. They just need to sit in the driver's seat, don't they? There was a subset of that category of cars being stolen by 10-year-olds. So, I agree that all of these things are serious issues and they do need dealing with. But I think to go back to talk, talking about the conditions, for example, yes, young offenders do go through different courts. They face different punishments, that sort of thing to adult offenders, but it, all of these are still, you know, these kids, you get a criminal record as an adult, it's hard enough to then change your, turn your life around. Reoffending rates among kids are, are far higher than they are among adults. It's about, I believe it's over 40%. So these kids effectively are being written off for life instead of actually trying to be rehabilitated. And this ties into the whole argument about is prison about punishment or rehabilitation. Also, prison conditions for children are deteriorating. There's growing use of restraints and isolation. And also, you know, you've got to consider we're not addressing the root issues. We're mm. responding to welfare issues with criminal justice responses. Your average happy, well-cared-for child does not go out and, you know, and commit violent sexual crimes or get into a car and go for a drive. What is the root issue then? Because some people would say, oh, it's being brought up in an abusive household. Other people would say, no, it's poverty. What is it? You know, what could we actually uh, address to prevent children being involved in so many crimes in the first place. Yeah, I mean, according to The Guardian and this report that quite a lot of this relates to comes from this ongoing series that The Guardian's running called Children in the Dock. And according to them, disproportionately, the law comes down on kids of black, Asian and ethnic minority uh, backgrounds. And the kinds of kids that we're seeing ending up in court often have ADHD apparently, autism spectrum disorders and other sorts of things. So I think that there's a range of kind of factors that are contributing to not only the criminality or people committing crime, but also the way that society responds to those people and, and the people who end up in court. And it's our society. You know, it, England and Wales have the highest child custody population in Western Europe. I don't think that's because we have unusually evil children. I think it's that we're not dealing with the, the issues properly. Who actually internationally do we think has got it right then? Who should we be looking to to learn from? In many ways, I think it's not about the age. It's more about how you deal with the young people who are getting involved in the criminal justice system. Because I think that you do need a mechanism in law that can hold people to account, even if they have diminished responsibility. So we see that in people who maybe have mental health problems later in life. A child, you could argue, has diminished responsibility because of their age and their lack of understanding. So I think that you, there's a way maybe to have a mechanism which doesn't end in going through the courts or going through or ending up in prison. 
And I think we also need to recognise that children do have a diminished understanding. You know, we're, we're all talking about, oh, you know, there's this thing they talk about it called the principle of dully incapax, which basically means incapable of evil, which was presumed of all criminals aged between 10 and 14 up until 1998. And then, you know, in the big push to get tough on crime, the Crime and Disorder Act abolished that principle. So, in fact... English law doesn't presume that children of that age understand the criminal wrongfulness of their actions, and that's a key issue. At the risk of sounding naive, I think we need to treat our children with a bit more kindness. Children in this country are being, children under 11 in this country are being tasered. There was a 2014, to throw more stats at you, there was an all-party parliamentary inquiry that found that a 1,000 children aged between 4 and 10 had been stopped and searched by police over the previous five years. Now, you know, some of them are are clearly, are presumably being exploited by adults and maybe they had drugs or whatever hidden on them and this all ties into the exploitation of children by county line drugs that's in the headlines recently. But we need to differentiate between who were the criminals here and who and when children are being exploited. Yeah, but making a hard and fast rule on the line of criminal responsibility and taking that as the most important thing doesn't differentiate, does it? That's the problem. I mean, if you're the victim of a 15-year-old uh, on a moped who, you know, runs over your sister, you're going to be thinking that person deserves to pay for their crime. You're not going to be thinking, oh, well, they're under the age of 16, so they should they, they had no responsibility to understand the consequences. Oh, definitely. And, and that, you know, and that person does need to be held accountable. I'm just not sure that shoving them in a prison where they just learn to be even more criminal is the way to do it. OK, but Kari, is there any evidence, actually, that the public are on side with this, that, you know, this is a story that has momentum that is going to end up in change? Or is this just a load of bleeding heart liberals, you know, sitting around saying, oh, it's such a shame? I would say this is anything bleeding heart liberals. Uh, to give you a list of, of um, you know, all of those that have all the groups and the people that, that have come out in favour of this. And just in the past few months, we've had the UN, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, senior police officers, MPs. The, the Children's Commissioner, Anne Longfield, the head of the Youth Justice Board, the Association of Directors of Children's okay, Services. Okay, so you think blah, this blah. is going to change? And also, well, there was actually a private member's bill um, to raise the age of minimum responsibility to 12, awaiting a second reading in the Commons just before Parliament was suspended by Boris Johnson. So it's it's consequently been ditched. But the fact that it was at a second reading, reading I think shows that this is a serious issue. Maybe one to watch. Probably one that tabloids would be campaigning on if uh, we weren't in an election cycle, actually. Well, it's time for us to release you from this prison of recording the podcast because that is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Kari Wilkin, James Ashford and Arian McNichol. Remember, you can download our entire back catalogue when you subscribe. Just search for The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sarah Miles at Rethink Audio. Until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye.